Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. We believe the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on today. Please help me welcome to the show, Councillor Trudy Clausen of the City of Prince George in the province of British Columbia. Trudy, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so Trudy, let's get the first question and the, the, the main question out of this the way. Where would your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I think it was, um, I think actually inborn because I, I grew up, yeah, uh, like uh, because I grew up in a community that made um, its statement was to not be involved uh, in, in the wider community. And so despite all of that conditioning, I was born with this burning passion to be involved, to uh, I mean, and, you know, completely idealistically, <laughs> but, uh, you know, now I'm 54 and it's like, okay, I'm not an idealist anymore, uh, but it, you got to start somewhere. And uh, as a young girl, I, that's where I was. I wanted to make an impact in the world. And so, it was really, yeah. No, go ahead. I apologize for interrupting there. Yeah, it was, it was not something that was acceptable in the community that I grew up in, and it was actively discouraged. Um, so what do you mean by actively? What, what, what do you mean actively discouraged? And I apologize because I, I want. I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about your upbringing and wh what brought you to municipal politics. But was politics not discussed at the dinner table, or are you? Is there other issues that I'm not seeing here? Because anyone who knows who. Anyone who knows who listens to the show, I don't do a lot of research because I want to learn from my guests like my viewers are learning from the guests. So what do you mean by discouraged? Well, I grew up in an old colony Mennonite community. And my um, and so that community has identifies itself as being separate from uh, every other community around it. And so actively okay. discourages any involvement with like we didn't vote. um and and you weren't you didn't run for office or anything like that now having said that my own household like my own parents were a little they were rebels but they were rebels maintaining sort of the peace within the community um and so, so was I politics young... discussed at the table absolutely all the time in our house <laughs> in our house what yes. levels of government was discussed at the dinner table? Because I always find it fascinating when I ask that question. People always say provincial or federal issues. They never really talk about the municipal issues, which most people get into. <laughs> For you at the dinner table, were your mom and dad talking about those federal issues or were they more talking about those local uh, community issues that people were facing? I would say both in that, in the sense that the, the the politics of how our community was run like um old colony mennonites don't live in a commune like hutterites do uh if you if your listeners are familiar but we each live in our own uh properties own homes but the community is very tightly um controlled just by virtue of you know everybody belongs to the same church and there's an expectation of how you'll behave so that was often and and that did have ramifications in in local politics in the sense of this is how we run our community. So yes, that was discussed. And as time went on, actually, my parents did actually become involved in the local, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't permissible per se, but my parents did become involved in the local egg society. This was in Northern Alberta. Um, but at the dinner, at the dinner table, most of the discussions were about, about our own little community, but also provincial, Provincial and federal politics, all of it actually. So how does a yeah. how does a little girl from Northern Alberta who is discouraged from getting involved in politics wind up on the city council of Prince George, <laughs> British Columbia? That is the most it's... convoluted question I've ever asked, but I'm asking it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I mean, you know, this little girl, she had great teachers in her little elementary school. It was a public school that we all went to. And um, 
I would have to say that the teach, like, I mean, besides my parents being, you know, always pushing at the boundaries. I mean, they were at the lowest totem pole in the, in the community because of their, they were rebels, um, sort of maintaining the peace sort of, but they were certainly, if you wanted to consider it on the wrong sides of the track in the community. Um, and, and so education was encouraged and of course, political discourse always at the dinner table. I, and, um, my teachers were always encouraging to me. And when I got married at the ripe old age of 17 to a husband that uh, had a great deal of respect for my individuality. And so we left the community at age when, when we, when I was 19 with our firstborn. And, um, and so we ended up, we moved to BC where we had, uh, it was sort of interesting how that happened. It was sort of like we were, my husband and I were talking about, Oh, maybe we should consider moving because we just didn't see a place for us in our community. And I think two or three days later, we didn't tell anybody because you wouldn't tell anybody that. Um, two or three days later, uh, a relative from BC called us and offered us, offered my husband a job. So two days later, we were off. And I, f- I, I find this a conversation very fascinating, and I do apologize if I ask some inappropriate questions during this. It's just I, I don't know what's inappropriate and what's not in today's society, so I always find – I'm not I very always... sensitive. I'm okay. not sensitive. Okay, that's good to hear. So, okay, I'm going to ask this question, and I'm, it's, it, uh, this just came to the top of my head while asking this. Northern Alberta, B.C., Let's be honest. There, there, there's a you. There's a large social demographic that is different from Northern Alberta compared to BC. What were there other options on the horizon, or was it that you said your cousin called you up and said we have a spot for you, we have a job for you, and you said nope, okay, was, let's go. No, it was truly that. It was that phone okay. call that brought us to BC. Nothing more. Yeah, that is a. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> I, I, I we, were, we were young and foolish. What can I say? <laughs> so you get you. Do you move right to Prince George for leaving Northern Alberta, or is there like other stops along the way, and then you finally settle in Prince George later on? No, we we moved initially to Burns Lake, um, and actually, my mom was born in uh, in the area that is now. Well, she was born in Burns Lake, but her mom and dad were part of a group of, I think it was 13 families that moved from Saskatchewan to uh, the Grassy Plains area, which was later flooded by the building of the Kenny Dam. And so, and they moved away when my mom was eight. So, uh, but now, nevertheless, there were a lot of Mennonite families that stayed in Burns Lake. And so we actually, I actually had extended family there. Um, and so that sort of brought us to that. That's who, who invited us to come work there. And then we were there for about nine months and then the logging operation moved to the McKenzie area and we spent four and a half years in McKenzie and, uh, but McKenzie was very much a mill town and we were loggers. Um, and so we thought Prince George would be a better fit. And so we moved, uh, actually to sort of what is considered a suburb of Prince George. We moved to the Salmon Valley area. And that's where we've been ever since. And I've all along the way, I was involved in politics. So, so when you moved to Prince George or Salmon Valley, the sub, uh, the the outskirts of Prince George, was municipal on your radar to get involved in? Because you could have chosen many different levels of politics to get involved, with, whether it be provincial, federal, school board, or local. But you, at the end of the day, in the last election, you decided you're putting your name forward for municipal politics so what was the draw for municipal for you um because of the impact uh i i guess i'm a bit of a because i feel very much so i i i have i feel like i'm i'm somebody who because we don't have that political history like yes we had political politics at the dinner table but there's nobody in my family extended or even yeah like nobody nobody wasn't actually involved in politics. And so I feel that I'm very much a student of like, I'm sort of a blank slate and it's like, okay, what am I going to do? And, you know, I'd always heard that argument that municipal, like, why don't more people run for municipal office? Why is the voting turnout so low for, for municipal elections? And so that I thought, okay, that I will, I guess I'm drawn to, I was drawn to the, the lowest thing on the, on the, 
on on the the ring sort of like well yeah and maybe i have that from my mom it's like you know look to the lowest spot and see if you can put a fill that in and, and build on that because often it's the things that get neglected that are the most important how long if that makes sense it does and how long before you ran had you moved to the area of prince george had you been there for 10 15 years 20 years five years almost two 30 years? Uh, almost yeah. 30 years yeah almost 30 so yeah that it begs the question what happened what happened to finally that switch go off well, when did that switch go off in trudy's head to say you know what this is the year this is the year that i'm going from being the political volunteer to the person who helps to being on the sidelines in politics to say i'm getting involved i'm putting my name on the ballot because i believe i'm the best person was it people asking you or was it just a thought in your head one day well, it's a, a combination of all of the above. Um, I, in 2018, I actually ran for school trustee, but I was a virtual unknown. Uh, I, I knocked on, I think, around 2,000 doors and got within, I think, 400 votes of getting a seat at the school district. Yeah. Um, but what made me decide to switch to municipal politics was, like, I know that so much of what happens in, especially in BC on school boards, it's like the ministry decides so much of that, right? And while there's certainly very worthwhile work to be done and and is being done, I I was, okay, so here's a bit of history. Um, I had actually, I'm a homeschooling mom. We had six, we had six kids. My husband was the breadwinner. Um, I mean, I mean, I certainly helped because we were self-employed. And so I was the, the bookkeeper, the payroll manager, the uh, fi financial HR, agent. HR, everyone. <laughs> everything and i did i did parts and supplies and delivery and all of that kind of stuff so i was very much the typical logger's wife but i also homeschooled all of our six kids and so um it was just our last child that spent two years in the public school system and and that's when i ran for uh for trustee so i thought okay you know what yeah yeah public school system is probably not the best fit for me i will try i will go into municipal politics because that is incredibly important and I did have a lot of people asking me after my uh, run for my unsuccessful run for school uh, trustee. Uh, I did have a lot of people asking me and encouraging me to run for local office. I want to talk about that first election, that first election when you ran for school board trustee, because we always remember the first time we go into that ballot box and we see our names on that ballot. <laughs> and it is a surreal experience that only a few people in Canada have ever had the pleasure to experience. Even if you win or lose, yeah. you get still get to feel that experience. And I've had it three times and I've lost every th all three times. And I can tell you the experience doesn't go away for you. What was that experience like going in from someone who was raised in a more, uh, uh, more uh, non political household when I say getting involved this way to then going and putting your name on a ballot and seeing it on the ballot and then putting an, x beside your name what was that experience like <laughs> or check that was really i mean you know what i i mean it certainly was unique i think i mean certainly i mean it was pretty significant to me but but i think most people who run find that right regardless of whether the, where they're from they all make that comment like "Ooh, it was weird to see my name on the ballot or like oh my goodness i voted for myself <laughs> how much of an ego do you have to have to vote for yourself in some days right <laughs> You, you honestly, yeah, I mean, there is certainly a bit, you, you would never go into this if you didn't actually think that you had something to contribute. So agreed, you know, but, yeah. But for you, was it was a surreal experience? Did it change the second time when you saw your name? Uh, yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. The second time was easier. So you yeah. had been in your community for 30 years prior putting your name on the ballot. Yeah, I'm assuming 30, yeah. I'm I'm assuming you d did what most politicians do or candidates to be politicians do. You go out and talk to your community during an election period. While there are macro issues, healthcare, education, infrastructure, what were some of the micro issues, the small individual in uh, the personal issues that you were uh, approached with when talking to citizens of Prince George? Well, so for this campaign, I knocked on the doors of businesses because I knew that I, as um, as a former business person myself and just with uh, my own thinking about politics, I, I, I have a clear understand. I really understand that business is what makes our economy happen. 
Um, and, and I mean, we, we all, every, every aspect of our society works together, but I mean, I, I'm, I sort of land on the business side in, in the sense that we need to encourage businesses. We need to encourage, uh, business development and all of that. Um, and maybe, and maybe ask me to drill down a little bit more if I'm not answering your question. So when I, when I, the reason that I ran, uh, basically for, for municipal politics was, we had lived in the area for almost 30 years and we had not seen the, po the, the population grow. So Prince George, when we moved here was at around 75,000. And then we went through several times where the population dipped and we actually had to find new friends twice because they all moved away. And that really hurt. I mean, it, it, it hurts your family. It, it, and it's, it's hard. It's always hard to make new friends. So that's why I ran, because Prince George was not growing. It wasn't providing the opportunity. Despite its untold uh, potential, we were not seeing that opportunity develop here to grow our city. And so we're still, like, I think, I mean, some people are saying, well, not, like, we have a real resistance to filling out the census, but we're still only at about, like, maybe 80,000 people, while all the other northern cities that we're acquainted with have grown over the last 20 30 years and so what is it with prince george that was my sort of that was were sort people of saying reason. the same thing at the doorstep or yes at the business and, and doorstep? a lot of our friends although see so when um so going to the businesses my 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 thing that i had that my, like my sort of pet thing was um we need to grow our economy we need to grow our city we need to be more business friendly um, and however, there were two things that came up time and time again at the door. And that was, we had had this massive pro a number of projects had been, uh, that the city had managed. There were massive costs to overrun cost overruns associated with them. And one in particular, we had built uh, a parkade and that was, had started off with a $12 million budget and we ended at 32 million. So that's a lot of money in a city with a budget of around 170 million. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was top of mind for everyone, but also what was top of mind for everyone was our downtown situation, because we have roughly about two, I mean, this is sim the same in so many other cities. Um, we have roughly 200 uh, people that are living downtown homeless. Um, and because of the nature and, and, you know, and I've learned a lot over the past two years because of the nature of, the drug addiction and and especially, um, it's not it's not pretty. Like we're not used to seeing this much garbage down downtown. We're not used to seeing tents and encamp and little encampments and um, you know overnight shelters being built in doorways. And Prince George never had. Uh, you didn't see businesses with. Um, I mean, so many of them have constructed. What I like because. Well, have so they've constructed basically hostile architecture in order to prevent, protect their properties and their doorsteps, and so those were the the actually the downtown issue was the thing that came up every single time. It didn't matter where in the city I was canvassing businesses, they said, "Okay, yeah, yeah, you're going to grow the economy and you are in favor of of uh, developing our natural resource sector, but what are you going to do about the downtown?" That was the question every single time. Were you shocked at that? No, actually, I wasn't because I knew it was really bad. We're going to be talking about the city in segment two of the show, but I want to continue on with you for a few minutes, if that's OK. And I want to go back to election night. The first time that you get that little blue check mark beside your name, all the chips are on the table. Everything you've done, all the hard work you've done going out, knocking on doors, talking to people, talking to businesses are all put to the test because on election night, after the polls close, you can't do anything but sit there and wait. And the wait is the worst part <laughs> about the whole experience of about elections. For you, when that announcement came in that Trudy Clausen was now councillor elect for the city of Prince George, what goes through your head? <laughs> well, it's sort of like, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you really, and really, you don't know, right? It's it. Um, over time, I think it becomes more real. Um, that night, it was really interesting. 
uh, we were, I, I hadn't known what to do exactly. And, you know, I didn't have this amazing, huge, really well-organized campaign team because I had no idea how to do it. And, but anyway, a friend of mine, one of my friends who'd helped me on the campaign said, well, then why don't you come over to our house? And, and because I was out, uh, oh gosh, I don't even remember what I was doing during the day, but anyway, so we went to her house and, and, uh, we thought that we were online and, and like, we're going to get the election results coming up all the time. And we didn't, and it's like, okay, it's like 10 after, 20 after eight, and we still had no clue. And and then we got the preliminary results or the first results, and it showed me, I think, at number seven out of nine or eight. And it's like, okay, I'm on the chart, but you know, we weren't getting updates and weren't getting updates. And then at and then suddenly my sister from Alberta uh sends me a message and says, Trudy, you won, you got your seat. And it's like, well, what do you mean? How do you know? Well, she had her learned in Alberta before I did even here. <laughs> so, um, and we had several devices loaded up that we were sort of following. And I don't know what happened. It's an interesting thing. But anyway, so my my sister from Alberta let me know that I had actually won my seat. Um, does, does, and I just, the, does the joy turn to apprehensiveness in a quick moment? Because you now are elected. And you now have the duty and responsibility to dictate where things are going. Well, not dictate, but vote on policies that are going to affect the financial issues that businesses are dealing with, the financial issues that residents are dealing with. You are going to be passing budgets that are going to be uh, uh, dictating service levels in your uh, community. How much of a weight and responsibility goes on your shoulders after that joy and excitement wears off and it goes, okay, now the real work begins. Um, I think maybe, maybe because I've always lived my life with a lot of weight um, and I welcome that weight. I had six kids, right? Yep. And I raised six children. Um, and I really always felt the weight of my responsibility as a mom. Um, so I, I think this is similar because I, I always treated that very seriously. And, and so maybe I'm comfortable with that. It doesn't, it doesn't, I'm not overwhelmed by it. Um, because I see that as my, my duty and, 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 and so I, I guess I, well, like I, this is, this is my mantle. This is what I chose this is what I was elected to so that weight is part of the job and I knew and maybe I'm just so practical um and I'm not uncomfortable with the fact that I like I know I'll, I'll make mistakes but I guess I'm comfortable with that what was the biggest learning curve because a lot of people who want to get into politics always wonder what it's like on the other side other side of that council table for you, what was the biggest learning curve and what advice would you give people who are thinking, you know what, I want to get involved, but I'm not sure if I'm up <laughs> for it because I don't know what it's like for you. Who's now in it. What's it like? And what was the learning curve? Like, I think, I think my biggest learning curve will continue to be um, learning how learning like sitting around a table of nine people and I'm a, I'm a straight shooter. I say what I think. And so I'm a, sometimes, and I expect other people to do the same. And so when they don't, and when there's a bit of machinations going on or, you know, political maneuvering, like I don't get it. Um, because to me, it's like, say what you, like, I have no problem developing and making alliances with people that I agree with. I don't have to agree with everything. Like that's how I operate, but learning that not everybody operates that way. And so that, I guess political machination aspect is the thing that I will be needing to learn the most and, and learning that other people look at things differently and, and see things in a, in a more political way. Whereas I just, I, I, I don't, I just see, okay, what is the best thing for the city and how can we all work together to get that done? Um, I, Correct me I mean, if I'm maybe, wrong maybe here, just... and I, I apologize here, but is the city of Prince George elected at an at-large basis for their councillors? Yes. Or okay, they are. Okay, because that 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 doesn't. I don't need to ask those questions that are going to follow up here for a second. Yeah. But 
municipal levels of politics is a unique entity in itself. Unless you're in lower mainland BC, downtown Montreal, you're not in a party system. You don't have allegiances to a party. You are an independent getting elected to represent your city. I've asked this to many people on this show, and I like to hear from different perspectives how much respect comes into the play? How much How much does uh, respect come into play as a municipal councillor? Because you may not agree with every single councillor who sits around that table on 100% of the issues, but you have to respect them that they were elected just like you to yep. do the job and put forward. And sometimes your side will lose and sometimes their side will lose. But at the end of the day, you have to respect each other enough that the chips are where they are. And the issues that you've put forward and voted on may not come out your way or may come out your way. Does respect come into play in your job? Well, I think it absolutely does. Um, I think that's not that's that's not my weak spot. I think I don't have I don't have a, an issue with that. Um, I think it's um, like it, like to me, it's vital because you have to remember every single one around the council table did exactly that. They got those votes right and. But but you know what? Let me backtrack on myself a little bit because, um, because what we had we had these major issues in our city, but all five elect uh, incumbents were elected, right? And and it's like wow, we had all these issues, and all five incumbents who ran got elected, and so that is the, that is yeah, that's probably the thing that I've had to like. Okay, Trudy, you have to think about this. They got elected. Obviously, people like what they did. And yeah, so it is, it's, it's really important. And, and because you can't work together unless you recognize that. How important is it for you to listen to all sides? Because I can imagine you get presented with many different issues on a regular basis and Mm -hmm. you get presented what administration gives you in the report, in the, in the agenda package, each week, each council meeting, but you need to go out as counselor and speak to people who may be affected by this, or you may have to have people at a public hearing talk to you about this. How much How much do you uh, listen to both sides, but listen to all different perspectives and say, okay, I may think I know which way I'm voting on this, but until I hear all the ideas that are put on the table, I don't know. Yeah. So in the... So in the four years or yeah, four years between my school trustee uh, campaign and becoming a city councillor, I actually wrote a column in the in our local paper. And that was very much my focus is trying to write from all perspectives and bring people together uh, around the thing that the common value that we all share, even if we disagree on some of the peripherals. So to me, that's very important that you do listen to all those voices. But at the end of the day, someone has to make a decision. And if you are not able to look at all the information and make a decision that you think is in the best, if, if, if all you're doing is dithering, you're not doing your job. Like you actually have to, you, you want to listen, you want to get feedback from all, you know, the stakeholders, but also just, okay, what is best for the city? And you have to make a decision at the end of the day. And uh, that's something that I'm comfortable with. Um, sometimes it's really hard though, because it's like, oh my goodness, these people are not going to like it. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to make a decision of what is best for the city. And that's, that's the role. And you shouldn't be running for office if you can't do that. Do you tune out social media when you make tough decisions? Because social media can be one of these unique beast in itself where it can be a a hole of despair where people will complain and uh, yell into the void that is social media. But as counselor, you, like you said, you have to make the tough choices and you can't be persuaded by a vocal minority. You're right. Um, I think I'm like, I'm, I'm active on social media and I read a lot of it. Um, And when I hear people complaining I try what what I try to do is going okay where is that coming from especially when I think it's like I like they're a little bit off track and it's like they're not feeling heard they're not feeling that their concerns are being addressed and so I try to look past maybe what is exact what what is written or what is said and see what what's the point there behind that and also just recognizing that some people just like to complain because they've got no one else to listen to <laughs> what Trudy, breaking news right here people like to complain i am flabbergasted 
I, I, well, I, I could probably talk to you for another half hour just on these issues alone, but I want to turn to segment two now. And before I do this, I want to preface this first question by saying this. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not an opinion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a motion at counsel. This is her opinion. And we seem to always get a lot of emails about this one. <laughs> like every oh, episode, yeah. we get at least two, three emails saying, well, that's not talked about at counsel. Well, it's her opinion. Um, Trudy, in your opinion, as of recording this today, what is the biggest issue in your opinion? I keep on saying in your opinion, facing the city of Prince George. The downtown and um, the issue, the issues around that and, and finding a solution because so much of that is out of our control. So we have to work very carefully with other levels of government. Um, and I think growing our city, we have this massive city. Our footprint is, is was built to maintain, to have a population of 200,000. And we're still sitting at 80,000 uh, people. And so the cost of that, like that's why I ran on the thriving city and developing our natural resource sector because we need to grow our city. The infrastructure costs are massive and it's being born. So that's why our taxes are are, are high and people are complaining I, I because we've got so, we're so spread out um, and all of our, uh, like the infrastructure in the ground is like was built in the seventies and eighties. And so it's aging. And so we have, we're looking at these massive costs coming up. And if we don't want to have, have to put that burden onto the 80,000 people that are living here, and, and of course the business uh, sector, then we need to grow the city so that we can afford to actually replace that. So this is where we get a little bit of a political, not political as in like, oh, provincial politics or federal politics, but this, this is when the political questions come out, Trudy. You talk about the downtown city core, and I want to know from your perspective, what do you do? And I think there's a lot of people who are saying, okay, you were elected. You knew the issues. What have you done mm -hmm. since being elected to try to start that conversation to address these issues that you heard at the businesses, but also work with your provincial, federal, outside levels of government to address these issues that are happening in your city? Um, so I've been trying, I've been continuing my learning about the issues and, and I've gone to um, a lot of like information sessions, that kind of thing. And I know that that's like, like I'm, I'm impatient by nature. And so it's like, oh, I would have liked to solve this yesterday. Um, but everybody's saying this is not solvable in one day. It's not, so it, it will be a slow process. And I know that we've got something, I have not had time to read my uh, council agenda for Monday's meeting, but I know that there is a proposal to develop a permanent, well, not a permanent, a temporary, more permanent encampment area in the city um, to reduce the amount of spread out encampments that we've got uh, developed. And so I'm, I'm going to be reading that and, and, you know, figuring out if if that's something that I can support. Um, when it so comes to the these social, I'm, when it comes to these social, and I apologize for interrupting here, but when it comes to these social issues, I can imagine if I go talk to a hundred people in Prince George tomorrow, they're all going to have a solution that they believe is the best way forward. How do you, as counselor? Address these issues, whether it be home, houselessness, homelessness, uh, mental health, addiction, because that is one of the, I'm not saying the leading cause, but I'm saying that's one of the causes for homelessness. How do you as counselor look at the issue, get the feedback from the residents of how they would like to see it addressed, and then make that final decision? Because I can imagine, and I'm just saying houselessness because you brought it up. I can imagine it's a tricky scenario because there's a lot of people who say we should do nothing. And then there's a lot of people we say we need to throw millions and millions of dollars at it and you need to find a balance. How do you do that? Well, it's <laughs> not money. <laughs> the problem isn't money. Uh, I've heard numbers from reliable people saying that we're, we're spending $20 million a year uh, provincially and federally on providing services to the people living downtown. So if you want to divide that by the number of people that are there, that's 200 divided by, or 20 million divided by 200. I think that's around a hundred thousand each, right? If I'm yeah. not mixing if, up my zeros. If I, if I can do basic math, which I, I failed in high school, uh, sure. 
for, sure, let's go with that. So obviously- I will say, if you're going to yell at the counselor, yell at me because I, I, I brought us down this rabbit hole. So I apologize. Okay, <laughs> but anyway, well, but but regardless, I don't see any of them uh, having a lifestyle that most people could have on a hundred thousand, right? Like the the folks that are living downtown. So obviously, it's a systems problem. Like our systems are failing us, and we need like uh, we need to revamp what how we're doing things. I don't think that more money is the solution. I think it's, I, the, the little bit of research uh, that I did prior to being elected, uh, well, I did quite a bit, but the, what I found is cities that successfully deal with, um, with revitalizing their downtowns be, after something like what's happened in our city in the, in the past, it's been about seven years or 2017 was the year that our home downtown population really exploded. Uh, that was after the fires happened in Williams Lake and we had 17,000 people coming to our city. And after the fires, a lot of them didn't return. But I mean, that's sort of changed over the years. I mean, so we have people, I mean, and we're, we're the regional center, we're just gonna get that, right? And I know that's it's happening everywhere. But if if what we're doing isn't working, if, we've, we're, if we're spending $20 million and it's not working, more money isn't the problem. We obviously need to look at the systems, and so, and and at every, and like the research that I did showed that the communities, the, the municipalities that succeed at fixing the problem, is are those that work together, that get all the agencies to work together, and that is a massive job. And I'm and we're not even, um, I, I I would say on that part we haven't even begun to scratch the scratch on that, even though we would like to, but it's hard. You talked about growth and there is a large push over the last, I'd say, year, two years since uh, the pandemic uh, for growth of communities. People are coming to large regional centers from smaller communities now. And with growth comes housing. Housing is a big issue that a lot of communities are facing right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you didn't talk about housing, but I want to just ask the question because it seems to be the topic of discussion federally and provincially right now. Now, is Prince George set up for that growth when it comes to people moving into the community and being able to find an affordable house or a house in general? We are we are a great place to come and we welcome all builders to come here <laughs> because our, our permitting times are really low, are low in comparison to many <laughs> other, uh, especially uh, places like Vancouver. So come here, build here. Uh, we have a lot of people that need homes. Uh, the most recent housing survey that we did had us, had us at being short 10,000 units. Oh, wow. So yes, we are short. And yes, our house prices have gone up. Um, I don't expect that they're going to come down much. Even, but I know that um, uh, our mayor has been. Uh, he's trying to do some research around this and and trying to find find ways that we can build homes that are more affordable for first time home bu- home buyers. And uh, and one concern always that I have is that as we're looking at uh, building uh, maybe smaller homes to make it more available to first time home buyers, is we don't want to develop neighborhoods that are made up of exclusively small homes. We need to think about, uh, like, I'm really in favor of, um, what's the term? Multi, like many different kinds of housing in, yeah. in neighborhoods. Does NIMBYism uh, come into play into uh, Prince George? Is there a lot of people who say, I, no, we don't want to grow. We like the way that we are. And how do you balance yes, and, that and, aspect? Well, I'm going <laughs> to, I had a friend actually say, oh, I, I don't want my neighborhood to change. I don't want, you know, um, multifamily housing in my neighborhood it's going to change the dynamic and uh so if if they're listening (laughs) here's my response to that your community has changed your neighborhood has changed when uh 20 years ago when you moved there there were probably young families there with small children those small children have grown up and are now in university they're not playing on the street on the bikes and if we put in a few multi uh, multi multi-family housing units uh, in that area, you might actually get the kids back. Uh, you might actually be able to keep your elementary school open. Uh, there's so many reasons to um, to change and adapt because it's um, because because uh, change happens regardless. And yes, nimbyism is a massive problem. And it's like, come on, people, things change. And just because you know people are talking about actually making change happen doesn't mean that it's not going to ha- that change won't happen if if we don't talk about it it, it happens all the time 
you you've talked about growth you've talked about the downtown core you've talked about solutions of how potentially we can start looking at different ways to address these issues but if i go to your community tomorrow and i ask 100 people that same question what is in their opinion is the biggest issue facing them they may tell me the downtown core they may tell me houselessness they may tell me growth they may tell me this that or the other but then they're going to get down to the micro issues the I have a pothole in front of my house and it is the mm -hmm. worst thing in the history and I need the city to fix it. And I'm not sure if it will, or I want a better park in my community, in my area because my kids need better access to parks, so on and so forth. As counselor and as council, you have to take the city as a whole and grow it as one, but you can't forget about the local issues, the people who've elected you, the independent yeah. issues that people are facing. So how are you as counselor balancing those issues? Because I can imagine when it comes to a budget, which you, I'm assuming you just went through because we're at the beginning of the year, um, you have to look at the growth of the city, the city as a whole, but you also have to balance that city as a whole issue with the individual issues. Have you found that balance? I think, I think in terms of, um, of those everyday issues, I think our staff does a really great job of dealing with that. Do you hear about I them think, often? Yeah, we, we occasionally get uh, emails. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, you occasionally, know, Trudy, come on. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, you know, I think, I think to be fair, our, our staff do a great job of dealing with most issues, but we do occasionally get issues like, uh, snow removal people don't like the way we do snow removal um uh and then i re recently went on a ride along with the rcmp and and um for for an evening uh until i think 11 o'clock at night i wasn't brave enough to stay till one but um or maybe i did maybe it was one yeah i think i was it was till one anyway and he was from uh newfoundland and he said oh saint john's has much better snow removal than prince george but but they don't do sidewalks Right. They when they're plowing snow, they don't have windrows in the middle like we do. They but but they also don't have sidewalks then. They are, their sidewalks aren't plowed in the wintertime. So hey, wait, well, hold, hold, wanting... whoa, 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 Hold on two seconds. Prince George plows people's sidewalks. Yeah. Well, not not to their house, but along the sides of the street. Oh, okay. I think that like the ones in front of people's houses. I was like, can can you come do that no. in Calgary? Because I don't have to go outside. <laughs> like, come but, on. <laughs> go but ahead. one thing that we do do is we open driveways. Oh, okay. So you mm -hmm. remove the window. Oh, wow. That's a, yeah. I know when we I worked a in a, pretty... mis... yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But, but we do have a lot of pothole potholes we do. Um, and you know, I mean, that's part of just, you know, northern city living, right? So, but those issues are important to people, right? Even if it, it they, they may totally seem like are. an annual thing that you're going to have to deal with over the next four years of and it's, snow removal, and, you have to deal with them. And it's going to get worse. Uh, it's going to get worse. We had a almost eight percent tax hike this year, Whoa. Th like that the previous council had put to get like that budget that we just voted on. Um, but I can tell you that we're actually spending less on road rehabilitation than we were the previous year because our increase in that budget was not big enough to allow for inflation. Where was that increase from? If you don't mind me asking, I apologize. It's just 8% seems like a very high number when it comes to me. It was. So we had one year of 0% increase. Okay. And then, and the next year we had uh 3% and this was happening during a time when we had, you know, for the, for the things that a municipality uh, buys, it was around, our inflation rate was probably around, I think it was around between eight and 11%, hmm. both like both those years. So we're behind. So that's why we need to grow the city. I can imagine. Yes. And do people want to grow the city? Like, are you hearing people saying, okay, you know what? I don't want to see an 8% increase ever again. I'm, I'm, I don't want to see any increase, but like, I'm comfortable with a one or 2% compared to an 8%. Are people willing to say, you know what? You're right. It's time. We need to start growing. So that way we can bring more people in and then it will cost less for me as a taxpayer when it comes tax season. I, I think that's a message that hasn't quite reached most people. I don't think people see that connection yet. Okay. Uh, I know that um, some of my fellow counselors said, well, yeah, but this is something we talk about a lot. But, you know, sometimes just because you're 
you think it's being talked about, the message isn't getting out, right? So I think that's something that as council, we're going to have to talk about a lot. I mean, our new mayor is very much, that's always center of his discussions. So I think slowly it, people are going to make those connections. And um, and I'm certainly like, I'm on the finance and audit committees, committee. So that is something that I'm going to be talking about. And this year, as we look get a better look at the budget, um, and, a B, and I'll actually be part of the budget making process, um, that's some certainly the message that I'm going to be sharing a lot and saying, people, if we don't want massive tax, uh, tax increases, if you want to keep water coming to your house, we need to either grow the city. Well, no, the, the only solution then is to actually grow the city. There, there isn't anything else. Yeah, there's no option B here. It's grow the city or no. we, we cut services left, right and center and your pool access might be closed or your ice rink might be closed and then we'll really be yeah. hearing about it. So you have yeah. to make the choice. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a tough thing because I mean, people, people, and back to the change thing, like, it's like, Oh, I don't want this multifamily housing development because it's going to increase the traffic. And, and it, yes, it will. And, 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 you know, sometimes the road isn't upgraded enough or, or our transit isn't upgraded enough. Um, but those are things that we have to work out over time. I, I, I know I, I said 45 minutes and we are at the 45 minute mark, but I'm going to jump into segment three. If you got another about 10 minutes with me, Trudy, if that's okay. I do. Okay, perfect. Yep. So I, I want to turn because I probably could talk to you for like three hours. We might need to have you coming back on later <laughs> on this year to do part two of the Trudy Claus and uh, counselor. Well, then I think you might want to. <laughs> Okay, uh, what's your question? So I want to turn to my last segment. And my my this segment is the fun segment. As much as I didn't think that the last two segments were fun, as a tourist of Canada who likes spending his tourism dollars in Canada, I've made a pledge that if you come on my show, I'm coming to your community. So I will be in oh, Prince George later this year because I'm doing a big swing through BC from all the communities that were there. Gosh. So as I have listeners from around Canada and around the world and viewers, um, what should people do in Prince George as a tourist? What are the hidden gems in the community that people need to see? Oh, golly. Well, if you're into mountain, there's so much, so much. If you're into mountain biking, we have an organically grown and what, or, or organic, organically developed mountain biking trail that is slowly over time becoming more official. So it's called Paderni. That's the name of it. And uh, it is, it's on, there's, uh we're we have a bit of a circuit developing um for mountain biking and so paderni is is on it um and uh there there's a lot of great trails there and they've actually like there were there all kinds of amazing things happening there so paderni is one um i would like to tell you that you should come for the sand blast but we ended the sand blast because we have cut banks we have these amazing cut banks that i can look out of i'm at city hall I can look out the windows and uh, the cut banks of the Nechaco River. And so what people used to do, and I think it's about 15 years that they haven't been having it because someone took a couch down. So the, <laughs> so it's it's a hill that people would go, would they would take whatever, and it ended the day that somebody took a couch down and somebody was injured. I think somebody broke a leg. But it's a hill, you know, sand, like it's uh, cut banks. And that was a great event. I'm hoping, I know that there is interest in re re rejuvenating that and bringing it back. So that's something. Uh, we have so many trails everywhere. We have just an amazing amount of trails throughout our city and in the area. Um, and if you're coming here, uh, where, do, where are you located? I'm in Calgary, uh, Calgary Alberta. Okay. All right. So make time for stopping at the ancient forest, which is between McBride and Prince George. There you are going to be in, uh, I think it's called a, um, a, a North Central BC. It's sort of like a temperate. It's almost like a rainforest. There's math. There's a five, there's a cedar tree in there. That's five feet in diameter. No, no five meters in uh, circumference. Wow. And so more than five feet in diameter. And it, this is a newly developed area um, that I think it's maybe been open now for four years, for three, four years, three or four years. And it's just a wonderful stop. Um, half, it's roughly about halfway between McBride and Prince George. Where and do you I mean, oh, we have. Go ahead. We have the Nechaco River where um, I think usually it's the safest in August 
to go floating down. You go out to Wilkins Park and you float down and you make sure you get out before you reach the freezer or else, <laughs> or else it's not curtains for you. <laughs> but, um, so that's something. Um, we've got, we actually have a, a fruit, fruit winery uh, that is winning awards. And so, and we're very proud of that because most of the I mean, I probably half the population in Prince George has family down in the lower mainland or in the Okanagan. And so we're all familiar with their incredible winery, uh, you know, industry over there. But we have one fruit winery that is endeavoring to eventually uh, source all of their products in our area. Wow. Um, and they have this amazing, I think it's their strawberry rhubarb wine that gets awards every year. And, and it's on a beautiful location. It's a beautiful building. You've got to go there. Where do you go? Where do you go after a stressful day of council or a long day at work? Where do you go and decompress in the city? And before you answer, you can't say your house. You have to say somewhere okay. in your community. Where in the community? Because every councillor or mayor wants to say their house. I'm joking, though. <laughs> but where do you go to decompress in Prince George? Um, there's so many places. We've got Connaught Hill. It's this little knob of a hill in the middle of the city. You just you can either walk it up, walk up it. There's stairs, or you can drive up, and it's just a spot. It's a beautiful park in the middle of the city. Over, and if you walk around it, you can see the whole city, or virtually the whole, whole city. Our city's so massive, you can't see all of it. But uh, it's right in the plopped right, like right behind. Uh, if I look over there, I see the cut banks like that I was talking about. And if I look the other direction, I see Connaught Hill, and it's a beautiful, beautiful park. And then we have uh, Clayton Memorial Park, uh, which is just is it's right by the Exploration Place, uh, which is our museum, which is also a must see when you come to Prince George. Uh, but that park has beautiful walking trails. And then we have Cottonwood Island Park and then we have Ginter's Park, which I just discovered, I think, about two years ago, two and a half years ago. And that is um, one of the first he was a beer baron, I think. Beer. Yeah. He developed, he built a house up there and now all that's left is the foundation. So it, it actually, you walk up there and it actually looks like ruins and it's like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I love going to Europe. So, and so here we are, we have Prince George's very own ruins up this, the side of the hill. It's a beautiful area. It's a, people have turned it into a park. Uh, it's sort of one of those un, um, unofficial parks, but uh, it's a beautiful area. And so that's also a lovely area just to go for a walk and it's just gorgeous. I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today, Trudy. This has been an honor, but I'm going to end on this question. And this is the million dollar question. And you can take as long as you want to answer this. In your opinion, what makes the city of Prince George such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Hmm. Because um, so when we moved here, it was very obvious, like Prince George was still a fairly transient city. And so people were extremely friendly. Uh, because all of us were sort of like we were desperate, like we got to have friends because most of us were away from family. So that has changed a little bit over the years. Uh, but but I I think the, the magic of I'm, I'm a big fan of northern and rural remote people because we think outside the box. We're not we're willing to try something new. We know that it takes a community to to build things. We're not as reliant on our governments to provide us with everything because government is simply far away. Um, so I think that's the thing that makes um, makes northern cities unique or northern communities unique. I think what makes Prince George unique is just our proximity to nature and the fact that, you know, here we are, this mid-sized city and we're far, like our, the nearest closest uh, other city is like Kamloops, which is five, five and a half hours away. Um, and so we're this, nor we're this little hub that, you know, we, we have this role as being the major center in the North, but um, I mean, I, I, I'm of the opinion that we're not getting near enough of the provincial and federal government dollars that we should have as a North cent Central hub in terms of healthcare and, and mental health and all of that stuff, right? Um, what was the other question? Three-part question. What makes it such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? And to raise a family. I think raising a family here, it gives gives you the opportunity because it's more affordable than so many other places. You get to have a lifestyle that you don't get 
uh, living in other areas. And because nature is so close, everywhere you are, uh, you have, like, if you choose to spend the evening, your evenings in your life, in your home, you know, going to work, going to school, coming home, that's up to you. But there's so much outdoors, just so close. That's what makes us unique. Meanwhile, we have a, an incredibly vibrant arts community. Um, because I think one thing that happens when you live in the North and, you know, you've got, uh, uh, you know, dark hours all winter is people turn to music, people turn to arts and drama. We have a fabulous little theater, Theater Northwest, and then we have Miracle Theater that's a, a nonprofit entity. Well, both are nonprofit, but that one does fundraising. Uh, we have all like, we, we have a really rich community and we have really awesome restaurants. Well, you've we painted really a, a very uh, colorful picture that I'm looking forward to experience it firsthand while I'm up in Prince George later this year. Um, but I want to thank you. I, I know I said thank you beforehand, but I want to honestly thank you. This has been an honor to have you on the show to talk about your community of Prince George, yourself, your upbringing and some of the issues that are facing your community, because we often forget about municipal politicians. We often forget about municipal governments on the national stage, and we need to start shining a light on this. So thank you so much for helping me shining this uh, spotlight on Prince George, but also on the bigger municipal issues that are facing these communities. So thank you. Well, and if and if you will allow me just, um, I, I will also say, Prince George is a great place to come and build and invest. We are at the center. We've got LNG coming through. We've got the WAC Bennett Dam happening. This is the place we are. Uh, we have our airport. Uh, we have an international airport. Um, there's so much potential here that I really hope that if you've got listeners that are in the business world and they want to look for a place to invest, come to Prince George. We are at the center at the crossroads, uh, just a great place to invest. And of course, to come visit, it's, um, it's just lovely. And there was one other thing I think, and I forgot. So I'll think of it, you know, in an hour. <laughs> So with that, I want to thank uh, Councillor Clausen for sitting down today and speaking with me. And I want to remind everyone, get off social media for at least five to 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. You'd be surprised at how much it can help you, help them, and help us as a society grow. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And we'll be back again tomorrow for another great interview. Till then, just keep talking.